Good morning, my name is James Little, and today I'd like to share with you some information about unknown identifications using MSMS libraries. It's part of an eight part series on this topic. I had previously done one on EI uh, searches using the MS, MS, using the NIST library and the NIST software, but I wanted to mirror that in the MSMS libraries. People are probably much more familiar with doing EI searches in the NIST library software, but I believe it MSMS can be equally as useful for identifying things by tandem spectra or MSMS spectra as opposed to EI. And we've been utilizing this approach for many, many years at Eastman successfully. And I wanted to share with you some of our reflections on that approach. So as I mentioned, there are an eight part series and this is the second part. So there are many more if you'd like to learn more about it, but this will be mainly talking about the NIST MSMS search software and the libraries, the actual search part. Each one has a handout on the internet and you can find them on my website that we showed on the first slide, a little mass spec and sailing, and it's broken down into different topics. And I tried to put an index in the front of every, every one because there's a lot of different topics and I thought this would make it easier to find what you were interested in after the fact. And there are 38 slides as a part of this handout that we're just looking at here, the high points of it. But what I want to talk about in this particular presentation are the three basic types of NIST searches. One, if you'll remember in the EI ones that I presented, there are mainly two, the hybrid and just the identity search. But here there are three that I find useful. One's called the EI simple similarity, and that's a little misleading because it's really just measuring things, looking at things directly to see how they match. Uh, the EI, because it could be used for EI, but this is really what I use for MSMS, and it uses a direct peak matching, and that's what I tend to, to name it in my, when I save my configurations, and it's used for finding similar compounds. The second one is an MSMS identity search, and it looks at fragment ions, but it specifies a precursor ion. So it only looks for things that have the specified precursor ion. So if, if you don't have it in the library, you won't get much useful information here because it's so specific. The last one is called the MSMS hybrid search, and I'm very excited about this. This is a novel search method that's been developed in the last few years. And it's very, very useful for EI, and it's also very useful for MSMS or tandem identifications using the NIST library search. And I'll talk about that more in detail. It really just extends the dynamic range of your database by looking for similar things that are shifted by some common mass, or they call it delta mass. And we'll talk about that in much more detail in session three. So I think I'll leave it at that for right now. I'll show you one when we go through the live demo, but uh, it really needs to be discussed in detail because it's a little different. So it takes, you have to get adjusted to looking at the displays and thinking about how it works. So we'll talk about that in detail, but it's very, very powerful, very powerful. So let's go to the live demo now and talk about some of these searches and using them in the software. In session one, we talked about the use of this software and how all the windows work. So I will, I'll repeat a little bit of it here just to remind you of what you can do in it. But in general, you, you have to save the configurations for these three types of searches. And if you go to this thing and hover, you'll see it's called library search options. And there's a lot of things to set, it, set up in here to make it work correctly. You have to put every information in every one of these tabs. The good news is after you do it once, you just save the configuration and you don't have to do it again. But in the handout, it tells you how to set these up for the three types of searches. And I won't bore you with the details in the live demo, but if you need to do this or want to do this, then go through the, the handout and set up your own configurations and save them and you'll be done. After that, you'll have three ones that you won't have to do again. So I've already set these all up for the demo. So the first one I'm going to do is a direct library search. So I'm going to make sure I've got the right configuration. So I'm going to restore the one that's called the EI similarity. I like to call it the direct peak matching when I named it on my configuration. So I created this configuration. I'm going to reload it. And so I brought it back into focus. You can see it changed the screen a little bit. All right, as you remember from the first video, always this is where you import things. This is a spectrum that was imported from the Agilent a QTOF data system, their Mass Hunter software, and I'll select it. And to make it search, you just double left click on it. 
and it does the search and it searched a million compounds you'll see right here where they are, where my cursor is of these three different libraries. Uh, there are three different libraries in the, the NIST software and I failed to mention those, but they're in the handout. If you go back and look at them, there are three ones, the high resolution, the low resolution, and the APCI that's uh, extractables and leachables. And I search all three of them at the same time. If you want to learn more about what's in these specific databases, NIST has spent a lot of time trying to find pertinent compounds and they continue to do that as we go into the next three year cycle. So they put a lot of effort in this and it's really paid off. There's a lot of different, use, very useful spectra in this database. And it's very inexpensive, I think in my mind, uh, to have this resource. So I think you ought to look into buying it and shop around. There's a lot of different distributors. Let's go back to the search again. And I've set it up to do all of these three databases here. And again, you can double left click to get the search. It's searching a million things, or you can just hit the go button to search it while you have it selected. But whichever way you do it, you get the search results. The search results are shown at the bottom. And I just click on the first one and you can step through them with your cursors on your keypad. I'm using the up and down arrows to go in both directions to quickly search, look through them and look at the results. And you'll see in the other displays, this is our unknown here. This is whatever Agilent decided to send in as far as labels, as far as collision energy, precursor ion, et cetera. This is your unknown on the top mirrored. This is your unknown on the bottom, or this, uh, this is the known, the best one that I've picked over here on the bottom. And as, as we step through them, you can see them being changed. And the bottom's just the detailed information for the spectrum in the library. Uh, this spectrum came from the, uh, high resolution library of the NIST library. Again, you always need to make these menus do what you want. Uh, I noticed first here that it's letting things go off to the side here. So remember, if you right click on anything, you bring up properties, then you can change whatever you want to do. I'm going to turn off the, uh, I'm gonna make it wrap so it doesn't throw things off the screen. The other thing is you'll see it's got the molecular formulas here and the accurate mass. I, Personally, I'd rather not have but just the accurate mass. So I'm gonna make that go away by clicking on the uh, right field there. I'll hit that first to get that. And I'm gonna go back, go to properties again on the spectrum here in this case, I click right clicked on the spectrum. I'll get rid of this formula Y minus B and these will go away. So you just have the mass to charge there and not the formula. And then of course you want to, if you like that, then save it in your configuration just overwrite your current configuration with another one. All right, so let's, let's talk about the search again. When I double left clicked on this, I hit go. If you look, it's always trying to tell you things. It's telling you here at the top that it found 52 spectra after it did the pre-search. The pre-search makes things faster by getting the most likely candidates before it does an exact search. And in the, in the handout, it talks about all the procedures that it goes through. And it's probably worthwhile to understand those, but I won't go through them here. I'll leave that for your study. And there's 52 spectra searched. It tells what type of search did it. It did a simple EI search, which I call peak matcher default uh, search. I had it my own name. And it tells what it will do next here. It'll do it next if I click it again. This tells what it did the last time. So this is always trying to tell you, what did I do last? What will I do when I click the go button or double left click it again? It'll tell you here in the middle, which libraries it searched. We searched the three uh, NIST libraries. You can have your own libraries if you want to. And we'll talk about that in another session. You can use the Mona databases, use the Wiley databases, et cetera. But here I've just used the three uh, very high quality NIST databases uh, that work very well to, to demonstrate the software. And if you decide that you don't want this histogram, again, think about making it personal for you. So I just usually push that up, just grab the bar with your left mouse and push it around. Uh, I don't like not seeing all of the information. So I left click the bar and expand that a little bit. Uh, you can sort on columns and the reverse match and match. The match is what it usually shows. How does it fit with respect to a thousand? And in general, when you do MSMS searches, you'll find that the match factors are not quite as high as one would find in the EI type searches, but still the best ones at the top. But you can resort by other things like reverse match. Reverse match, if you remember, if you look at the software, uh, in the user's manual if you want to. If you have ions in your unknown up here and it searches the library, it doesn't penalize the 
factor here, this reverse match factor for things that are present in your unknown at the top that are not present in your known at the bottom. And that can be handy, especially in MSMS -MS in cases, because the MSM MS spectra are not as reproducible as the EI ones. That's because the, it's the energy dependence and the solvent dependence. There's a lot of instrument dependencies that go into getting a good MSMS -MS spectrum. So what NIST has done to kind of get around this limitation is they just acquire it at lots of different energies. And so you add it to the database in lots of different energies and that gets rid of the differences you see, but you can always sort these columns. That was what I was wanted to tell you just by clicking on them. You can sort by the libraries, you can sort by anything. It just resorts what you have. So that's a, a demonstration of that search. The other thing is you can see that it's got this amazapir. It's got the different energies. That was at 60% uh, high collision energy, 50, 45, 75. It matched the 60 best. If I wanted to get down to another possibility, I have to step through nine things, which is just a little aggravating, time consuming. So what they put in here, they put in this best matching only. And how that works is it only shows you the best matching for the same CAS number. So you can see we had 52 spectra initially in the search here. This is done after the search and you don't have to research to get it researched, you know, double left click on it to, to, when you change this value, you just click on it. You can see now it's taken it to 19 spectra. That got rid of all the amesopyr type spectra and the next one down is what I'm interested in, but you can see it's fallen off to a match of 275. And if you look at it, you can see why. So really that's really the only reasonable thing to consider as a possibility as a candidate for an identification. So you find that very useful. The other way you can sort is by this funnel, this little filter thing. And this again is done after the search. So if you want to change these settings, it just changes the results that are shown but it doesn't change the search results that you get. Uh, usually it's best to turn this off. So you can see now I have 19 spectra up here. Usually when I do the search, I like to have this off because I'm afraid that it might filter out something that I'm really interested in by one of these parameters that it has in its meta uh, tags for the spectrum. So I'm gonna hit that okay. And you can see that my spectra went up to 37 here. So I was, I was filtering some stuff which was probably okay, but you gotta be careful because it filters on a lot of different parameters like instrument, whether it's positive ion, negative ion, or that it included MS to the third spectra, did it include isotope where you took the M plus two ion for a chlorinated compound and fragment it. So you can make it not show that. Uh, so it's probably best initially to turn that off. And I usually leave that on a lot of times. You could turn it off. So like I said, it doesn't take you a lot of time because that's after the search, you just turn these on and, and minimize your display or, or maximize the type of results that you're interested in. So that's pretty much the, the different type things here. And of course, you wanna save your configurations as we mentioned before, after you get them like you like it. So let's look at the second type search. This is the one that's called the identity MSMS. -MS. And let's bring it up to focus. And we're going to research here and say go double left click on the name. And you'll see here it found 67 spectra. Uh, let's, uh, let's make sure everything's not filtering out anything. So we're gonna live off the CS number for a minute. I'm gonna step over here to make sure I didn't mess up and turn that on. I didn't, so it's not filtering anything there. Again, we found a lot of the amizapir that are all the same. So let's uh, minimize those a little bit by using the click on the little thing that looks like an arrow through the target get rid of the things with the matching CES numbers. Now we're only down to six. So this is a much smaller list than the things that just find direct comparisons. And the reason that is, is because when you do this search, like in this case, 262.1179, it specifies filters on the mass accuracy. And most importantly, it only looks for spectra that have a precursor ion of 262 within the parameters you set with the, for mass accuracy. And then after it finds that, then it shows you fragment ions within the specificity you set, depending on the mass accuracy of your instrument. So it's very specific. If it doesn't, if it's not in the library with this precursor ion, with the spe specifics you set in the parameters up here, whatever you set there, if you look in my handout, it'll tell you more about that. It won't find them. So it's very good if you want to find an exact mass. It doesn't find things that are similar, like in the first search, things that might have similar fragment ions. It only finds things that have the same precursor. So a very specific 
uh, spectrum. You can see you got the same results here. And the next one down uh, is just really low fit. Here you want to sort by dot product. Uh, dot product works better in SCORE in MSMS spectra because of the few number of ions, the score doesn't mean as much there. Usually if the score is close to the dot product, that means you probably got a pretty good hit, but usually sort on your dot product. Of course, you can do reverse dot product, like we talked about for reverse mass spec, so it's not penalized for extra ions and you can resort for those. But usually dot products, what you want to sort on for this type of search. So that's the second type of search. Let's, let's talk about the hybrid search just a little. So I'm going to go and get it, and we'll bring the, uh, that in for the similarity MSMS hybrid, the third type of search. I don't want to save. I didn't change anything I wanted. So I'm going to go up here and double left click on that and do a hybrid search. The hybrid search is very interesting because it finds, it extends the dynamic range of your database. It finds things that might differ by chlorine that you wouldn't find and the similarity, the first two searches, you wouldn't find if it shifted it by 34 in the mass spectrum, you wouldn't find it in either one of them, but you would here. You would find things that, uh, that are different. So like the delta mass, the delta mass, it says, this is actually our a mesopyr there, but this is something that's related to mesopyr. This is like a, me a mesopyr that's uh, short of a 28 group or, as opposed to this compound that does have the ethyl group on it. We're going to talk about the hybrid search a lot in session three because the displays are different. You'll notice they're much more complicated. The number of columns that you get are, are much more complicated, but it's so powerful. You really need to learn how to do the hybrid search. And we'll talk about that in detail. So I really don't want to go through that in detail right now, but we'll get back to that in session three. So be sure to come back for that. So, that's pretty much the basic demo of the three types of searches, uh, excluding the hybrid, which we'll discuss in detail. So I hope it'll, you'll find it useful, but remember, go back and take a look at the handout. You really need to set up the parameters correctly, correctly save them to your configuration, optimize your space that you use information on the screen, get it like you like it, as opposed to how it comes out of the box, and then give it a try. I think you'll be impressed when you use the NIST uh, search with the NIST libraries that you buy, and also with the Wiley that you can buy, and with the Mona, uh, we'll talk about that in another session, how to get this uh, Mona database of, of maybe 143,000 spectra, which I think is very complementary to the NIST. I think you ought to have the NIST, but the Mona's free, and I think you should all use all of them. So we'll talk about that in the future. So come back, and we'll talk about some other topics 